Hi, welcome to part two of week two's online TA review about proteins. Please, at any time, leave questions or comments down below. Also, give me a thumbs up if these videos are helpful. As always, I love feedback, so let me know if there was anything particularly helpful or ideas that I could try. I'm going to be breaking up the video into four different sections. Feel free to jump ahead to any part as needed. The four sections are separation of proteins, quantifying and measuring proteins, I'm also going to be asking you questions, and then we'll go over a few of the exercises. I'm focusing only on data analysis questions from the packet. If you have other questions, please ask Dr. Bridgewater or a TA later. Thanks. So to start us off, I'll be talking about separation of proteins. Now when I say separate, the goal is to purify something. Purifying is to get rid of all of the other stuff that you don't want. If I'm trying to study a protein, I don't want DNA and RNA and other molecules interfering. In this case, there are two main ways of separation, column chromatography and page. When I mean page, I mean running a gel electrophoresis. For proteins, we'll use SDS page. Now proteins differ in many ways, including size, charge, other properties. So separating proteins takes advantage of these differences. With column chromatography, we have three types, gel filtration, ionic exchange, and affinity. Gel filtration separates by size, with the largest molecules, the largest proteins, going the fastest. Ion exchange separates by charge, and affinity by special bonding. It's important to understand how chromatographies work. We use a, a column filled with beads. Now the type of beads we use will determine how the proteins are separated. Gel filtration uses beads with tiny grooves and holes, which forces the proteins small enough to fit inside to take longer getting through the column. Bigger proteins can't fit, so they just fall straight through, weaving in between the beads. It's like having to weave through all the little streets of a city versus taking the highway. Now ion exchange uses beads of either negative or positive charge. Let's use beads with a positive charge for an example. Proteins that are negatively charged will be attracted to the beads that are positively charged, while the proteins that are also positively charged will run straight through. Affinity beads utilize special bonding, such as antibodies, designed for a specific protein. The other proteins will run straight through. We are able to separate proteins by pouring them through the column and then rinsing the proteins out with a salt buffer. This is called eluding. Chromatographies give us a graph based on the timing of when the proteins came out. The initial proteins that ran straight through will be collected as the first fraction. Each of these test tubes you collect represents one fraction of the entire solution. So after you've taken your first fraction, you'll elute a second time, and that will become your second fraction. You'll do this until all the proteins have come out. I didn't draw it on the graph, but usually the salt concentration is also shown to tell you how the concentration increased. Proteins bound to beads require a higher concentration of salt to get them to fall off. By the time you get to later fractions, the concentration is much higher than the concentration you started with. Through this process, you'll have different peaks, signifying different groups of proteins. For the next couple of minutes, let's talk about quantifying proteins. Usually, this is done in two ways. Spectrophotometry and enzyme activity assays each give us different units. SPEC will give us units in OD, which stands for optical density. Assays will give us counts per minute or units per minute. To measure OD, we take a fraction and put it into a spectrophotometer, which will shine light through the test tube. Based on how much of the light is blocked at the 280 nanometer wavelength, we can then measure relative amounts of protein. The more proteins there are in a fraction, the more light gets blocked. High peaks of optical density indicate a high amount of proteins. Okay, now enzyme activity assays. Enzyme activity assays are are the second way that we can use to measure and quantify proteins. There are additional reasons why we would do an assay though. The first one is to check for protein presence, presence of some type of enzyme or protein. We can also use it to find out relative levels of activity. 
Here's an analogy. So let's say you own a restaurant or hotel, and you wanted to know if your chefs are present, if they're there. How we will set up an assay is adding substrate to our test tube under the assumption that if the enzyme is there, we'll get product being made. Substrates are anything an enzyme uses, kind of like ingredients, in order to make a product, or in this case, dinner. Going back to the purpose of an assay, it can help us know if the enzyme is there or not. If you see that no dinner is being made, you know your chefs aren't there because if they were there, they would be making dinner. On the other hand, if you do see dinner being made, that's only possible because your chefs are there. Going back to the second purpose of the assay, we also wanted to look at activity levels, and we do so by utilizing radioactivity. Do you remember CPM? CPM stands for counts per minute. Those counts are counts of radioactive particles that are released. The more CPM or the more counts that we get in a minute, the more radioactive the overall product was. Units per minute is just the general unit that we use, just how many units of product were being made in a minute. So going back to the analogy, if we used ingredients that were radioactive, we could measure how many counts per minute was given off of the dinner that was being made. If there is a high number of counts per minute, CPM, then there must be a lot of chefs present making a lot of dinner. If we only saw a few counts per minute, then maybe there were only one or two chefs in the kitchen because there wasn't as much dinner being made. Now I'd like to ask you a few questions to check for your understanding and to get you to think about what we've been talking about. What can you tell me about the characteristics of these three amino acids? Only resume the video when you have an answer. Go ahead and take a second to pause the video now. Alright, how did we do? For this first one, looking at the positive, you should be able to see, oh, I see a positive sign in the R group, which tells me it is basic. In this other group, there are no special atoms, no oxygens, no sulfurs. That tells you it's nonpolar, which in a solution would act as a hydrophobic molecule. This last one has a sulfur group at the very end, which tells you it's available for disulfide bonding, and for this one specifically, we want you to know that it's cysteine. Okay, here's the next question. If I were to tell you that this graph was generated by running an ion exchange chromatography, what could you tell me about peaks 1 and 2? Now, if I was running a gel filtration chromatography instead, what could you tell me about peaks 2 and 3? Once again, only when you have an answer, do I want you to resume the video? Go ahead and take a second to pause the video. When you hear ion exchange, think separation by charge. Even though I didn't tell you the charge of the beads for the ion exchange chromatography, you should be able to know that the charge of the proteins in the first peak are more similar to the charge of the beads because they ran through the fastest. For gel filtration, which separates by size, bigger proteins coming out faster. Proteins in the second peak are bigger than the proteins in the third peak. Okay, let's revisit this graph, but this time I want to ask another question, the one that includes CPM. So if I did my column chromatography and also from each fraction ran an assay for each of those, and this was the graph that I got, what could you tell me about the second peak? Okay, that's all chromatography. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about PAGE, which stands for polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis, or PAGE, or gel electrophoresis, or gel for short. PAGE separates by size, charge, and shape. Both DNA and proteins can be used on a PAGE. STS PAGE, however, only separates by, on, on the basis of size and can only be run on with proteins. The way SDS works is by adding chemicals that denature the protein and coat them in a uniform negative charge. This makes it so that when you run it on a gel, the only thing that makes one protein able to travel faster than another is its size. Here's what a gel looks like. On the top is an electrode of negative charge which repels DNA or proteins down, while the positive electrode on the bottom pulls them down. The molecules try to go down as fast as they can, but they have to weave through the gel's matrix to do so. 
Therefore, if I put three different proteins in this SDS page, which of the proteins is the smallest? The answer would be C, because it traveled the fastest. Now I want to ask you some questions to help you think about the things that we've been talking about and help you to integrate concepts. So, the first. If this was an SDS page, you would know that the band which ran faster down is the smaller protein. Well, how do we get proteins of different sizes? Most likely, they came from mRNA of different sizes. How do we get different lengths of mRNA? Well, perhaps I splice them differently through alternative splicing. Would it be because one protein had more subunits than another, making it bigger? No, because remember, SDS involves adding chemicals that denature the protein, breaking any bonds that would be holding one subunit to another. Let's see if you can do this one on your own. Here's a chromatography graph. What kind is it? What would make one protein be more positive than another? What amino acids would that protein be rich in? Take a second to pause the video and ask yourself. Amino acids with R groups that are basic are the ones that are positive. Do you remember which ones are the basic ones? Okay, take a quick break if you need one, but now we're going to talk about the exercises, starting with exercise B, A, then E. Now, if you've been to my TA sessions before, you'll be familiar with the four steps that I encourage you to take, which will help you understand what you're reading. This is a skill that needs to be practiced and developed in order to fully understand what these data analysis questions are asking and how to answer them correctly. The four steps are purpose, methods, data, and conclusion. Basically, the purpose is the why. Were the scientists trying to answer a question? Were they trying to purify something? The methods are how they went about getting an answer. What tests did they run? What chemicals did they add? Then the data. What results did they get from those tests? What can you see that might have stuck out to the scientists who originally ran them? Finally, understanding the data by knowing how they got it, what conclusions can you make about the purpose? Like I said earlier, this is a skill that has to be developed, and it has to be developed over time. So I'm going to walk you through the four steps for exercise B, but I want you to go through exercises A and E on your own. You'll notice for this exercise, it's outlined using the four steps. If you'd like to, pause the video and take a few minutes to read through. The purpose is hinted by the word hypothesis. We're trying to see if the primary structure holds enough information needed for a protein to be able to fold. The way it folds determines if it can do the job it was designed to do. So the methods, the way we went to find that out, is we purified RNAs. There's that word again, purify. That means all we have in our test tube is RNAs. Then, we studied its natural activity by using an enzyme activity assay. This gives us something to compare our results to. Then, we denatured the enzyme by using beta mercaptoethanol and urea. We removed the denaturing chemicals, then reperformed the assay with different concentrations of the reduced or denatured protein. If the protein was able to fold back on its own, we'd expect to see activity. In the data, you'll notice that there is activity, even though we denatured the protein after we gave it a chance to fold, it did. And we know that it did because we see activity. Were it all still denatured, none of it would have been able to do anything. There's also an unexpected result that we see. That is, with, de with decreasing the amount of proteins we added in, the more activity we saw. This is most likely because as one protein is trying to refold, if there's another one that's close by, it might accidentally bond with that one. Here's an example. If all the proteins are supposed to just fold back on their own, say with a disulfide bond right here, and there happened to be another protein refolding close by, they could accidentally form a disulfide bond together, preventing both proteins from being able to function normally. Okay, now let's jump back to exercise A. This time, though, I want you to do it on your own. Read through, see if you can identify the four steps. Pause the video now. Okay, here's what I got for my four steps. Compare notes and see if you agree. Now, if you need one, here's an analogy to help you understand what specific activity is and what's happening. Say you have a huge network of batteries all hooked up to a machine that tells you how many volts you have. Some of your batteries are dead though, and you, don't want, and you don't know which ones are. So you go through purification steps to try and take out the dead batteries. 
As you do, you might accidentally take out some of the working batteries, with the hope that you'll take out more of the dead ones than you do the good ones. Eventually, you'll be left with a, with a fewer number of batteries, but you're more confident now that all you have left are the good batteries giving you the watts you see. This would be high specific activity because before you had high you had high activity but also a lot of dead batteries. Now, even though you have less activity, it's high specific activity because there are fewer batteries with more of them actually working, which is the whole purpose of purification. Okay, exercise E. I'm going to show you snapshots of my four steps and the chemical structures of the amino acids, which will help explain why different mutations perform differently. Pause as needed to read through. Thanks for watching and thanks for being such an awesome class. I apologize for this video being up so late. I spent way more time on it than I thought I would. I'll try my best to have two weeks worth of review up every week. Leave any questions or comments below, especially if there are things I didn't say correctly or clearly. Good luck with reviewing. Be sure to remind yourself how awesome you are, and I'll see you in class. Bye.